Good evening and welcome tonight's Scuba Meeting. It's Monday, February 27th, 2023, 6 o'clock. I'm with Susan Tully, Lives of the Board of the 1887 building. Mr. Gayhart. Here. Mr. Gatton. Here. Mrs. Ingersoll. Here. Mr. Martell. Here. Um, here. Mrs. Ray. Here. Mr. Scarrow. Here. Ms. Colton. Here. Ms. Williams. Here. We do have a quorum. We will continue. Tonight's meeting was noticed for state statute. Uh, do we have any participation? Okay. Hearing none. We move to the local office. All right, we have the. Do you have a copy of the? I've got a copy. Do you want me to do it? I'll be on the notary. So, Mr. Gannon, do you want to stay on the grace? My pleasure. I state your name. I, Devin Gannon. Who has been duly appointed to the Elkhorn Area School District Board of Education. Who has been duly appointed to the Elkhorn Area School District Board of Education. Swear that I would support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Wisconsin. And will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability, so help me God. All right, we can read All right, thank you. And will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, I am Paris Norma Hopkins, principal for grade 6 and 12, and tonight we have Tristan Monday, who is our art teacher, and she is going to talk about art seminar. So I'm Kristen Monday, and I teach for you at um, CCA, at SOFOS, and then at Options. And so I've been at Options since we started, since the very, very beginning. And you know all the wonderful things that are happening there. Um, so last year, Sarah came to me with an idea about doing some sort of art seminar, art studio type of class for kids the high school students that needed extra art or needed, I have an art therapy background as well, so if they needed some of that or just, you know, we were just kind of playing around with it. You know, I had this time at the end of the day and it's like, what can we do with that? So I had about four students last year and it went really well. This year, I probably have almost 30, 20, it's a lot. <laughs> so it like picked up like really fast. And what we do is, um, and I'm going to pass around some artwork of theirs. But what I do is, I like to incorporate a lot of literacy and other subject matters with, with the art projects. So they all have to, they kind of have their own private like art studio time. So they can, I taught them how to like create like a Pinterest board, like an account, and they, they have like just different pictures that they just shave and save and they can share with me um, ideas that they like. They just collect images and then kind of narrow it down and figure out what they want to do. They can use any art medium. So we have everything out. <laughs> like they can do, and I really taught them like, here's where the stuff goes. You're in charge of, you know, Part of art is clean up. <laughs> so they're really in charge of like their space. Like they get out if they want like acrylics or oil pastels or watercolor. So I brought a couple of the things that some students have done. And then what I have them do is at the end, so they bring it to me at the end and I just sort of go around and kind of coach them on, you know, whatever they need. They sort of just ask me as they go because every single student is doing something completely different. Um, I was kind of talking about. But when they're done, they write, they have to write an artist statement. And so they have to title their piece, which is harder than you would think. <laughs> like they, they struggle with that a lot of times. What art medium they use, what inspired their piece, you know, were they inspired by another artist? Were they inspired by, you know, a photograph or a feeling or emotion or what was going on with them when they were creating this? 
and they just write up like a little like here's the one that goes with that one they just write up a little tiny little blurb and then they hang it up all their artwork up together so there's just some really i mean they're like real he was honestly his his write-up is how he was inspired by I just garbage cans in the backyard. Like, I mean, you just don't know where it's going to come from, kind of. And I mean, there's a lot of really, really good talent. And we even had a student last year that was kind of, some of them do little campuses. But uh, we had a student last year that she had some health issues, really, really high anxiety, you know, different things that, that kids come to options for her. And she was amazing at art. And we, we really started working with kind of like art therapy. And now she's um, going to school at Mount Mary for art therapy. So she decided that she, yeah, she wanted to keep going with it. And I've kind of been like in touch with her like all summer. And we got her book. She didn't know, like, I don't know how to apply to college. I don't know how to do any of this. So, and I graduated from Mount Mary. So, <laughs> so I was like, I got that. Um, but yeah, this is just kind of some of the neat stuff. I mean, they, they can do, again, it's just a variety, <coughs> anything they want to do, any meeting. But it's been a really huge success. So, I'm thinking we're just going to keep, keep going with it. I don't know if anyone has questions or. I have to say, when you walk into Kristen's classroom, those students are so involved in what they are doing that there's a quiet hum. Yeah. In that classroom. They're really just like they're talking to each other, they're working. It's, it's really a, a wonderful our music playing. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there's a good vibe in there. Did they get high school credit for them? They do. Mm -hmm. They have credit the last you know, it's not really a question, but I mean, I, having a daughter that goes out, I go out there and I see you like these up on the wall, yeah. you know, all the time, and they do an amazing job. Of it. Yeah, really we have a lot of just amazing, they work so hard. I mean, it's really, I, I don't like to use the word talent all the time because it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, it's not like they're just like, woohoo, and it's all done, but uh, they, yeah, they really work hard. And, these same students have it, they kind of get double dosed in art. They have an actual art time that they come for art class. And then this is an additional class. So some of them are in my room for two hours almost. And um, so they're getting, they're still getting like regular content and technique and their regular art class. And then this is just a chance for them just to have that autonomy. I mean, you know what high school kids need. They they need to be able to do what they want to do. <laughs> they don't always want to listen to, here's what we're doing next. And it's just, it, it's been such a great class. And it's just time for them to sort of talk amongst themselves. I mean, they aren't always with other students. They're, you know, they're working from home and they have a chance to be together and have conversations about what they're interested in. And it's such a wonderful group of kids. Yeah, I just love these guys. Yeah, this is what we're gonna do in an options. Mm -hmm. So thank you for letting me share all this with you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And then we need travel requests from the baseball team. All right. I let Mr. Storley know that I would um, go ahead and share this for him from the, um, the school. Uh, this is the same trip, and Mr. Storley, this is his first year serving as head coach. Um, coach Anzalone has taken this trip and gone to the same 
And Mr. Sorley. Ethan and Mr. Sorley's been with them for years. Um, it just got lost in that transition, the formality of that approval, uh, which we typically do. Um, I believe in the, either the, in the fall or yeah. in the spring when they get back and they, they report from that. But it, it's the exact same trip that we do year after year, so they're seasoned and experienced in that. Uh, they'll be going again over the spring break. Uh, they go to Myrtle Beach. And um, all the plans are pretty much the same. The only difference is Coach Anselm is won't be on the trip, at least not as the head coach. Um, Mr. Strode is there, and all the details related to the uh, trip are there as well. Um, still plan to use the same Jones busing, they do coach bus there and stay for the week. It gives them a nice opportunity to get a jump start on the season since our weather is a little unpredictable and they how many um people do we have doing baseball this year that will be going on the trip great question i did not know that <laughs> <laughs> well the detail, i know they always follow lots of parents go with them yeah. because it is over that spring break right, right. um so they always have plenty of chaperones and it's an amazing trip my son went on it and it's Hugely beneficial to team bonding. Yeah. And, and, and traditionally, they, they usually take the JV and the varsity, right? Usually they 20 didn't, to 30 players. When, when Ross was playing, they didn't, but now they, I think the last couple times they've started doing that. Yeah, get, get the coaches mm -hmm. a good look at it. Um, Expected, does that mean that the players have less funds than they have to raise or uh, themselves, or is it always going to be $200 and then the rest just goes into a, a different type of fund? Um, John, are, do you happen to be, can you speak to that, how that's traditionally been handled? Yeah, the, the, the trip cost altogether is about $22,000. So certainly it takes quite a bit of fundraising. And it, yes, if there was additional fundraising that exceeded the expectation of what the team thought, <clears throat> that amount would be reduced. So that's just really to supplement the trip. And how many players typically go, John, in recent history? I think last year we took 24, and that was varsity and JV. And we've done that the last two times. And so I know kind of working with Mike through this and setting this up this year that um, he was doing that as well. And I think he scheduled two JV games and four varsity games while they're down there. And so you typically get them approximately 80% of the event fundraised and covered? Correct. But yeah, it is kind of costly and, and it does help and to have the kids supplemented a little bit. And we have in the past had kids that expressed that they wouldn't be able to go and we found a way to give them a scholarship if it came to that. But there's no other questions on per our policy. We do need to recruit this as it is. I move to approve the overnight travel request from the high school baseball team as presented. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded to approve the overnight travel request from the high school baseball team as presented. Uh, Mr. Gayhart. Yes. Mr. Gatton. Yes. Mrs. Ingersoll. Yes. Mr. Martell. Yes. Oh. Yes. Mrs. Ray. Yes. Mr. Scarrow. Yes. Ms. Colton. Yes. Ms. Williams. Yes. Word right. minutes. Um, the regular session meeting from uh, the 13th and then on the 20th. 
and then a uh, closed session from the 13th. That we would need to get approved. We need to do a little stuff early. Uh, Mr. Gadd, you should probably be staying since we're back to um, any questions on this? I can help the closed session. Is it all be separate? Just follow it? Okay. Separate. Yep. I move to approve the minute. Oh, other questions? No. You, you no. say no, no questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, I move to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2023. Regular session school board meeting as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. So moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2023 regular session school board meeting as presented. Mr. Gayhart? Yes. Mr. Gadden? Same. Mrs. Ingersoll? Yes. Mr. Martell? Yes. Donald? Yes. Mrs. Ray? Yes. Mr. Scarrow? Yes. Ms. Colton? Yes. Ms. Williams? I have two. She carried. Move to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2023 closed session school board meeting as presented. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2023 closed session school board meeting as presented. Roll call vote. Mr. Gayhart? Yes. Mr. Gatton? Abstain. Mrs. Ingersoll? Yes. Mr. Martell? Abstain. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mrs. Ray? Yes. Mr. Scarrow? Yes. Ms. Colton? Yes. And Ms. Williams. I move to approve the minutes of the February 20th, 2023 school board meeting as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 20th, 2023 school board meeting as presented. So Mr. Gayhart? Yes. Mr. Gabby? Abstain. Mrs. Ingersoll? Yes. Mr. Martell? Yes. Oh, yes. Mrs. Ray? Yes. Mr. Scarrow? Yes. Ms. Colton? Yes. And Ms. Williams? General and other fund bill, Mr. Truman. The uh, general and other fund bill this evening covers checks number 148659 through 148760. Wire transfers number 732 through 738. ACH checks number 522 through 549. By an amount of three hundred nineteen thousand two hundred ninety-seven dollars and forty-five cents. There was a memo providing some additional information on several of the bills in your packet, and then following the bill listing is a copy of the treasurer's report for the month of January. Questions, Mr. Trump? So, what was the MJ Care Inc. So, uh, no, it was OT service. I wasn't sure. Occupational therapy service? Got it. Special ed. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Hearing none. Okay. I move to approve the general and other fund bills of February 27th, 2023, 148659 to 148760, wire numbers 732 to 738, ACH numbers 30. 522 to 549 in the combined amount of $319,297.45 as presented. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> so moved and seconded to approve the general and other fund bills of February 27th, 2023, checks number 148659 to 148760, wire number 732 to 738, ACH number 522 to 549 in the combined amount of $319,297.45 as presented. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gayhart? Yes. Mr. Gatton? Yes. Mrs. Ingersoll? Yes. Mr. Martell? Yes. Tom? Um, yes. Mrs. Ray? Yes. Mr. Scarrow? Yes. Ms. Colton? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. yes. Motion carried. Provisions for the 23 24 school calendar. Okay. Uh, we have two calendars to look at tonight. The first one, the 23 24 calendar, which was uh, approved last year. Uh, so this is next year's calendar, not this coming year's calendar. There's a request for one modification to it, and a, it was based off of positive feedback from, in particular, teaching staff and families as well. On the 15th of February, 
Uh, they would like to shift that day before the end service on the 16th to a full day of parent teacher conferences for the kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, yeah. Um, followed a similar format to this year, so that would be a modification to that calendar if approved. It's going to change. Amy, anything you want to add to that? Or no, I think Jason that covers it. Uh, we had very positive feedback being able to offer uh, morning conferences and times throughout the day to allow um, you know all working parents an opportunity to come in face to face, um, very favorable uh, experiences. And so we'd like to continue that twice a year. That would also involve our 4K sites. Um, they too would then conference on that day as well. And then the other conference is that October 26th. That is correct. That's yep. the second one you're referring to. From a, a minute standpoint, the elementary has approximately 12 days worth of additional instructional time. This is still even about 11 days worth of additional instruction. So you guys didn't see any drop off due to the fact that it's the day before there's a no school day. So the parents are just day to take off or do you know what right now there's just day in a row that they're yeah. out of the weekend, obviously. There's three days off. Of course, yes. this year we have so many. Did you hear that question? No, could they repeat that, please? The question was Did we see a drop off in the parent teacher conference participation because of that additional day off of school? Perhaps parents traveling out of town and going on vacation rather than staying to do the parent teacher conference? You know, interestingly enough, uh, I can only base this on October and, and this we've done this for two years in October now. We we certainly haven't. Now in October, we also offer another evening because we try to see all of our families in October. So, you know, if parents are going out of town, they usually opt for that other evening that week. Um, you know, this with the snow day, you you totally read my mind. This year would follow that similar pattern um, as well with that Thursday. You know, if there is an occurrence where a family is going out of town, other arrangements are made. Often our teachers, you know, put in a, a, a few hours on a different evening to, to make everything work. Um, you know, we try to stay within limits of like 20 minute conferences, but often if a family needs more time, we we flex and move on to other days. So I think we'll have to we'll have to see how that goes and then you know report back as to if it's impacted or not. Um, the other thing is with the early morning conferences that still gives families time to get on the road that day as well for those that are leaving town. Just a thought there. Yeah, my only concern when looking at it was that's a lot of days off for right. working families to have to figure out child care arrangements for their kids that may not need the conference or they have multiple kids or whatever because that's three days in a row off and then the kindergarten the 4k is off again that fall in the 21st um so. I, I see what you're saying, Jenny. I definitely do. Otherwise, moving it to another week causes, you know, just that Thursday off or or whatever day we look at. So that it, it there's kind of pros and cons either way. So I think we thought by clustering it like this, it would be very similar to the first snow day we had that just kind of led into that that longer weekend. Um, it's similar to how things look in October. With the exception that you know we don't have that Monday uh, designated as a day off. You're right. Yeah, I don't know what the alternative is because if you put it on a different Thursday, it's just, you know what I mean. It's one day off in the middle of the week, which is hard. No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't. Um, but also, just keeping it clustered like that, allowing long families that um, 
it's going to be very impossible for us to make uh, make everybody happy all at the same time. So keeping a cluster like that allows us to be able to at least give the kids and the families that can um, accommodate during that point a a longer re weekend than just a two per se three day weekend. Um, it, it at least allows them to be able to have a fourth day or or at least three and a half days after um, after they have conferences with the parents or even the teachers. Excuse me. But no matter what, those conferences still need to happen. Uh, so if it's on just a regular day, then they're still having to take off part of that day uh, to take care of the kids. At least then they can again plan for, hey, I now have off on Thursday and Friday back to back. One of the other benefits of just clustering it there was the return day that Friday is an in-service for teachers. So if we're asking them to put in 11 hours, 11 hours plus that Thursday, knowing they come back in Friday, they don't have to be prepared for students for a full day. They're, you know, prepared for meetings and, you know, time like that. But it's a, it's a different ask to have them here for that 11 hours. Um, I also agree, like you were saying, for the families, maybe clustering is better. It, it, it's still um, an ask for them for that day, but we're finding an increase in attendance. Um, many families do want to be face to face for conferences, which is, it, which we very much enjoy. Although we're able to do this virtually, or by phone if necessary. Um, but again, you know, I'm happy to report back next. March <laughs> after we've given it a go just to see you know how that how that timeline worked if there would then need to be adjustments to the following year's calendar so just to clarify so everyone understands that light blue day the teachers work from they they come in the morning and they do the night conferences as well so that's where I, I would not want to move it to a Friday right. because then we're asking right. people to Come in on a Friday night until right. eight or nine yeah. o'clock. Right. And if you put it on, as you said, Amy, on like a Thursday night, you know it's that's a long day to then roll into a work for the next yep. day that they that's typically do. Yeah, I don't have a guess a better alternative. So I know and I mean it makes sense when you yeah, a long day Thursday and then service Friday, mm -hmm. they get a Monday holiday. Mm -hmm. We would need a motion or action on this if we want to uh, approve that. I move to approve the revised 2023-2024 school calendar as presented. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to approve the revised 2023-2024 school calendar as presented. Well, Mr. Gayhart, yes. Mr. Gatton, yes. Mrs. Ingersoll, yes. Mr. Martell, yes. Donald, um, yes. Mrs. Ray, yes. Mr. Scarrow, yes. Mrs. Colton, yes. Ms. Williams, yes. All right. Jason, can I just ask to step back and have a correction on the votes? I had my days kind of mixed up with the meetings. For the February 20th meeting, I wasn't there, so I want to abstain on that one. And I had that mixed up with the 13th, which I was there, and then I would vote for that one. Okay, I got it. I got. I was a little confused there. I got my calendar here, but too many things mark too many meetings. But yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't able to be there on the 20th. Okay, I noted that on both. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The 24-25 calendar um, would follow basically the same pattern as the 23-24. Um, the difference is we did, in order to end school on this uh, week in June, actually this is a, probably the earliest since I was going to say, I, I can recall that it's, it's, well, it's because of Labor Day yeah. starting. Right. So early on the second, yeah. yeah. So we always start after the, the county fair, but Labor Day is almost as early as it can be this year. Yeah. So that awards us some flexibility, but in order to finish school on that 
that fit would propose doing 169 on uh, instructional instead of 170, adding a teacher work day um, on that shift, and then everything else in the calendar pretty much follows the same. Yep, the same calendar. On that. And I have, and I, I like that too. That it gives because we do lose kids when you have a two days before the Christmas break or so forth. People go on those trips, yeah. and it's a yeah. lot cheaper to go travel. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about. Yeah, it's three over three weekends. Yeah, yeah. That'll be nice. Right. And we'll be done first week of June. Yeah. 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 Well, we started. We have a shorter summer break in between. Either way, you do the same amount. Right. Right. Other questions? I'll move to approve the 2024 2025 school calendar as presented. Is there a second? Second. We've been seconded to approve the 24 25 school calendar as presented for public. Mr. Gannon? Yes. Mr. Gatton? Yes. Mrs. Ingersoll? Yes. Mr. Martell? Yes. Oh, yes. Mrs. Ray? Yes. Mr. Scarrow? Yes. Ms. Colton? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carried student uh, report. Yeah, I have it tonight in post start. I just like to say that the slides are a little less full you'll notice, and that's thanks to the amazing snow days we had. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chella. I did control the yeah. weather. <laughs> <laughs> way too much credit. Very yeah. thankful to you in my house. <laughs> um, so backpacking off that, at West Side, they had a top for dress up day. Uh, to the right of that, they're making clay communions in our class. And my favorite part of this presentation is seeing all the kids dress up as 100 year olds for the 100th day of school. I recommend going on Facebook and seeing all the pictures because they're very cute. Um, so, those are the two pictures. And then on the bottom right is Project Blue Vehicle, awesome. vehicle Restraint System for Collision. So, it's like building cars and you put an egg in it and you run into a rock and you can make sure the egg doesn't crack. Um, and Tibbets again, we have the 100th day of school, so you can see <laughs> how cute that is. And, um, so the UW Extension and the 4-H came and they made a paper meeting activity, so then they also learned about recycling and all that good stuff. Under that is just a picture that they made in uh, one of their classes, it's been in a, a snow globe with Olaf, and then their Valentine's Day party. On the left there, you'll see Abraham Lincoln and then the students. Uh, they had an assignment where they had to, if I were president, so they just made a list of things they would do if they were president. Um, so right at that, uh, they're making a weaving in art class. So that is the finished product uh, that students will bring, which I think is really cool. We did that when I was in elementary school. Um, again, we have our 100th day of school. And on the bottom, we have the gym class only. So at the middle school, I know the picture's a little blurry, but it's a, a big fat check from the mattress sale, $5,000, which I think is really incredible. Um, and then those t-shirts are, so they're learning about different types of careers in the engineering field. And then they were also learning about graphic design. So they combined the two and they made some t-shirts of their chosen careers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then on the bottom there, you'll see youth fields is building their outdoor classroom. That's completed now. Oh, I just saw the new pictures of the closer. Yeah, am I, uh, I, I know there was a visitor from Project oh, Rejoy yes. National that came yes. and visited the yes. elementary middle school and high school. And um, long story short, she was blown away by the implementation of the program that we have here next. Fall project lead the way, which there's over 10,000 school districts in the country that do project lead the way. Um, will be they've asked us to host a nationwide site visit to those schools that will invite educational 
leaders from around the country to come and see what the kids are doing. Awesome. And I don't know if that's where the pictures got posted for that visit. Yeah, but probably. Yeah. All right, so at the high school, there's been a lot of hard work and a lot of success and great accomplishments. So here are some of them. Um, we had Megan went to state for skiing. Um, we had our Southern Lakes Conference Academic Bowl, and we had three people who placed there. Um, we had our gymnastics team that qualified for state, and I think they were runners up. And then uh, two teams competed at the, the auto. Uh, the skill demonstration. So they had the first phase was a rain test, and the second phase was a skill demonstration. Um, they placed third, but they won a five thousand dollars scholarship for each person on the team. So I think that's really cool. And they also got fifteen hundred dollars worth of Snap-on tools. Um, and there on the bottom right is our very own Miss Jenny Greenmeyer, a culinary teacher, and she got closer educator of the year. So I just wanted to include that in there. Um, not featured. But just backpacking off that, uh, you know, Pulse had 40 qualifiers for state. FCCLA had a handful of qualifiers yeah, for state. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, gymnastics has also qualified for state. And then uh, Braden's owner for wrestling just was a runner up in the rest of it. So, a lot of great things happening in high school. And Jenny Waymeyer, this was for the entire state of Wisconsin. And ProStart is the organization which um, facilitates the professional certifications that the students earn for culinary arts and the post art certification. So um, it's a great recognition and in honor of all of that work that she's done in expanding the program, giving access to our students leading with professional certifications out of high school. Um, at options, there was a trackside skate race. And then um, for our mini maker fair, I know they had a bunch of booths and uh, Ms. Wachowski and the option school makes instructive fair participants in making Harry Potter wands and lightning bug paper circuits. So I know last year they did Star Wars. So yeah, I think that was always a really cool booth to go to. Do we know how many people attended, Joseph? I don't know how many attended the maker fair. I know they were pleased with the attendance and um, the booth was such an amazing event. Eric and Carter and Rebecca Mom um, did a fantastic job with, with that. Um, it was steady, it wasn't overly crowded to where it was not sure you could get in the booth, but it was, it was they were pleased with the attendance. There's some rough pictures right there on the way. I just included some of my favorites. Obviously, I had to include the goats and the puppies. So I did that. And then, of course, the land of building station. And then to the left were the CCA pictures and just continuing to remodel their space as well goals in collaboration with some groups. Thank you very much. Right, director's report. Hey, this evening we asked uh, Santa Holmes to come and speak to some of the programming. What's going on related to the Community Resilience Outreach Program? Thank you very much for your time. Uh, some of you folks know me for a couple times that I've come to update you on the Community Resilience position. Congratulations, and Central Homes. Um, well, tonight, I'm going to just briefly touch base on some community programs, collaborations, snack in the pan, but I am going to get in a little bit of detail about the Smart Recovery Program. So, community programs that have been occurring is I am continuing with a series of the In Conversation events. This year we are focusing on holding the events at the schools. So we have um, held at Tibbetts, Jackson, this month we're going to be at Westside, and this month we're going to be talking about managing family schedules. Previous conversations have been keeping it safe online and creating lifelong learners, which was last month at Jackson, which was nice because four of the teachers came in and was the panel. It was very engaging. We continue to do the book club at Matheson Memorial Library. And we've had some standalone programs 
Dr. Hanon came and talked to the community, as well as this Thursday at Madison Memorial Library, we have Nami Rock County come and talk about mental health, the difference between mental health, mental illness, and the big thing that I'm super excited about with this conversation is a detective is coming and sharing about de-escalation measures for folks. So this is geared for customers coming in and business owners, how to determine if it's a escalation process with the Anthropology Police Department, or if it's a conversation to have with, with people to see if they can de-escalate. First and foremost, I was gonna say, call the police department for safety measures, but a lot of times it's learning techniques, and that's what they're gonna talk about this Thursday at Madison for the later part of the presentation. We've been working in um, collaborating with Health and Human Services a lot this year. One way that we've been doing that is they have a program called Hidden in Plain Sight, which they have held that program at the middle school and high school during conferences. There have been folks that would take that. I'm hoping to hear more of that presentation next year. Also, Health and Human Services came and spoke to all of our fifth graders in each of the elementary schools about vaping, and that was a big success. We have had um, fundraising initiatives this year. One um, way that we have done that was with Alcorn Benefit Boutique. We raised over $1,000 where folks turned in their own prom dresses. We sold them to make sure that everybody had the opportunity to go to the dances that is held here within the school district. Also, I've worked with fundraising for the Hope Squad within the schools. We were at the Brat Hut, and then we did, we called it Hope for a Minute, and ran through the bleachers at the beginning of the school year and raised funds that way for the Hope Squad. We are working on establishing a nonprofit. This has been um, an adventure. We have our fourth meeting tomorrow night, and this is all the meetings are held in different locations within Walworth County. So tomorrow meeting is at the Lion Sealy in Lake Geneva, and it's from folks all within Walworth County and raising awareness, seeing the resources that we have out there and community members working together. So is that like going to be a board then throughout the county because you need Know, multiple numbers yeah, on yes. the so We're on that in Elkhorn. No, not solely Elkhorn, but all of Walworth County. And it's up working with programs that are already out there, like NAMI, like Mental Health America. It's just more focused within Walworth County because what we have found out is that a lot of fundraising measures within these organizations go throughout the state and funding is done. Nothing really stays strictly here within Walworth County we want to make sure funds do stay here. So it's a collaboration of everything, of all of us working together to make sure every um, person is in the um, Another thing that I have been working on is interns with Gateway. So I am on my second intern, the first one graduated, yay for him, sad for me, but we have another person, Riley, that I've been working closely with. She had finished the, the um, website and all of our resources are out there, as well as working on email blasts that I have now initiated and sent out to keep everybody up to date with the new programs that are occurring here within Elkhorn. Snack in the Pack. I'm sure you folks have heard about Snack in the Pack, and, and we have received great many donations for this program. Um, this has been very helpful that the program has been grown. A student received seven items to go home with them from our elementary schools, and now we incorporated the middle school. Right now, the attendance from the middle school, attendance, the um, folks that are receiving funds or receiving bags from the middle school are low, but we're hoping that starting in September when school starts and they sign up for the programs, that that will increase. Um, for this to happen, we have received many donations from civic organizations, private businesses, clubs, and people also have stepped up to volunteer. As a matter of fact, we have a private school from Delavan coming to stuff the banks this Friday 
as well as they sold some items in their private store and they want to donate that to Snap in the Pack. So people from all over Clinton Waller County have really found a passion to make sure people are unified. As well as people, we have young people and older people that fill in the bags and they embroidered all the school's name on each of the bags because they felt like they should be identified of who gets how many bags. So that was really cute. And any of the other schools are any Does any of the other schools in the Florida County? They like, have somewhat of a sound to similar program, right. but um, as I know, Delavan is starting up, but they are struggling a little bit. And the only reason why I know that is being on the United Way board and yeah. talking to a lot of the nonprofit organizations. Yeah. Sure. That I mean, I know our need is great, but I know we need to from. Yeah, but it's, it's all around. It's, it's, it's everywhere. So yeah. it's supposed to be just being copied all over. It would be nice. And they do have a program called Blessings in a Backpack, yeah. which is trademark. Yep. That's why we stuck with Snack in a Pack, mm -hmm. since it wasn't trademark. Okay. Um, we feed 90 students a week, 360 students. And those numbers can vary. Like I said, I believe that they will grow um, to next year when you start at the beginning of the year when they can sign up for the program. Um, smart recovery. So this is where I kind of want to put the time into it. I'm just going to, if you want to take a look at these folders, when a student starts smart recovery, they get the folder. There's information in there. I have all the folders if you wanted to look. But as you have heard, an aspect of what I do is collaborating with folks to help them receive the resources that they may need. Sometimes I'm unable to see those resources help and help a family, but sometimes I am able to see how this position can build a family. I'm fortunate to see this through the Smart Recovery Program. I want to share a story with you, and I did write it down because sometimes I get too excited. My brain goes all over the place on this. A family comes into the Elkhorn Municipal Court with their daughter. They are not happy to be there because they feel the school picked on their daughter again in our citation. They see the judge and the judge feels that smart recovery may be a good fit for their daughter. Rolling their eyes as they come back from talking to the judge, they sign up for the program. And I shared with them, this program is one hour long, twice a month for the next three months, held at Madison Memorial Library. Reluctantly, they sign up for the program and both the student and the parent sign the expectation form, which is in that folder. So anytime somebody signs up for the program and I meet with them at the court, they get this program before or this folder. Before they leave that court, they have to sign that expectation form. Then they know the future dates that they come to that program. So I had my notions on how this family would accept this program. And the only reason that they even signed the program was the expectation that the daughter's citation will either be lowered or dismissed. So I know this going ahead into it. And I have my preconceived thoughts about it. The first meeting did not happen very good. Mom didn't see me standing at the entranceway and she felt I was not responsive or fast enough to welcome her. After she was welcomed and the mom was dismissed to leave for an hour, the daughter comes into the group session, sees four of her other peers sitting next to her, and just rolled her eyes. You know she had a chip on her shoulder. This first meeting comes and goes. Then the second meeting, the daughter starts talking a little bit more. She's feeling more comfortable and more engaged with the peers around her. All the peers started sharing a little bit of stories about what's happening at home and what's happening within the school. Third meeting, well, she's telling 15-minute stories. We have to kind of stop her so we can continue with the program and with our curriculum that we have that we want to work on. And by the fourth meeting, I think she wanted to leave the group. <laughs> she had done homework. She looked at the curriculum ahead of time and she was anticipating of what we were going to talk about next. Seeing this young woman grow and feel comfortable is a good reminder what I do 
with the, this program. And it actually stopped me in my tracks to not judge a butt by its color. Mm -hmm. I think most folks, especially young people in this program want to be heard. And once they feel that it's comfortable and safe, they know that they are. Smart recovery doesn't just focus on addiction or share about how alcohol is bad, but what it does talk about is a skill set to manage life. Currently, there's an intern from Credence, her name is Morgan, that co-facilitates, and we actually will have Sandy, who works at Jackson, that starts up um, this Wednesday with the group. So during the six sessions, the group talks about building motivation, coping with urges, self-management of thoughts, feel, feelings, and behaviors, living a balanced life in goal setting. And then the very last group is an evaluation. And I did bring their evaluations for the young folks that have graduated, what they thought of the program. All of us here, knowing how hard adult life can be, know that these topics take more than one hour to become a routine in our life. But no one in the group expects them to know this right away. They soak in the knowledge and they they don't change their outlook overnight. But out of the five groups that we currently run, with a total of 10 students finishing right now, we, we say that they graduate. They get a little certificate at the bottom um, when they leave. Um, they all shared walking away with a skill set that they learned, hopefully that they will remember, and notes that they can look through. I always say, you're going to push them off to the side until Kelly gets stuck in a rut, and then hopefully you can pull them back out. So currently there have been three groups that completed the course with 10 students graduating since we started in October. We will be starting our sixth group Wednesday. So it's a successful rotation. Um, the impact Smart Recovery has on the total of 20 students that are in there right now and their families since it started is a better understanding of social development for themselves, but most importantly, growing in their relationship with their families, their peers, and the community. And that's what we want. Um, is there any questions about the smart recovery? Yes. Um, yeah. So, number one, you said you said that it's a uh, they, they're set group. So, what I mean by that is uh, people aren't just um, showing up during different sessions. It's, it's a set yes. way you have it set up. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, how yeah. often do those run? Okay. So, the step is is that we go into court. The judge looks at their citation. If the judge feels that the student is a good fit, they come and see me. They see that expectation form. And then they're actually set with six days and a certain time frame on those days of their expectation for the next three months. And um, it's always, it's going to be a Wednesday and a Saturday. So it's only twice a month. So. Um, we had to change it up because they changed the court dates, but so it's the first Wednesday and usually the last Saturday that that happens. We start our first session 3.15 to 4.15, there's a 15 minute break, so then we go 4.30 to 5.30, 15 minute break, 5.45 to 6.45 on for Wednesday nights. And then Saturdays we start at 9.15 to 10.15, have that break. 10.30 to 11.30 have that break, and then 11.45 to 12.45. So you have six different cohorts running at any given time? It, yes. Yep. The, um, I hope, no, uh, the, uh, when people come into your program, um, I love the success story, but is that, is that common, is that normal like that, or is it just luck we, of the draw? So I always say as we start the program, you can't pick and choose of who the group is going to be. I kind of compare it, and uh, Ms. Williams and Ms. Cole, you may not understand this correlation, but I kind of compare it to the Breakfast Club. You have all different personalities that are there, so it depends on how they feed their personality. The first session that we had, no. You know, they were very, <laughs> they were very quiet, very, very different. You could not pull them back together. 
and it's a learning on our parts as well. As sessions have been going, it has been good. We try not to mix the middle school with the high school. So we do have one middle school session, um, a middle school group right now, super quiet. So that's been a little bit trying. Um, we have another session where, in this, this part is common, where four people are in a group, two people did not show that first day, so it's just two. And my rule is you can miss, but you have to reach out to me, and this is your responsibility, you have to reach out to me to make up that session before the next session starts. So, and those other two people didn't. So that two person group, it, it actually is growing to be very successful, but it's taken a little bit to get there. Is this countywide or just offline? I have to ask because there's so many different things that you're doing right now. That, like... <laughs> it's, it's a pilot program here with an Alcorn, okay. but so a couple. Correct. Well, it's whoever city of Elkhorn gives a citation to. So if oh, a student oh, so is here, yes, okay. yes, a um, couple of folks have reached out, and I would, I had met with the police liaisons and the municipal judges, and all of them said, "Man, it sounds like a great program. Start off in Elkhorn first, and then come sure. back to us." We. And I, I appreciate this has been a lot of work in progress to get to this this point. And I remember working with Safe Families years ago when I had a, a freshman daughter through Safe Families, or again, the lady that, that came to live with us, and had addiction issues. And there was, we looked all over the place. There was nothing within our region, our area, um, related to addiction recovery. Um, we were able to, you know, she went to a Rogers Day Treatment Program, came out very proud to be sober for, for her, I think it was six weeks at that point, but her sobriety lasted probably a month with not having that ongoing support for that ability to go into additional programs where she would have benefited from that, um, you know, the program that we now have is established, and I know it's been a lot of working with Health and Human Services, the law enforcement. I really appreciate um, the city of Elkhorn and our Judge Duquette and you know, the law enforcement and being able to help with that aspect. But I, I see this as something that's really going to take off and grow. And I know Cynthia spent a lot of time finding a research-based proven program that will have an, an impact for the kids. And it gives that positive alternative. It's something I was very frustrated with loss as that guardian not knowing what to do for my kid and not knowing what to do when you know the house almost burned down because of a hot wire bait that just got tossed in the trash can and started a fire but you had nothing to refer the individual to to get that that help so i hope this gives that parental support and the community support and enables us to start reaching those kids and as much as I hate to see large numbers in a program, I, I, we, we need to service the, the population of kids here. And as you share that, we all know that there's underlying need concerns with addiction, and this helps finding that skill set on a very basic level, completely basic level, to kind of go, oh, I see how that works. And you actually, as you talk through, you see their their brains working and going, oh, I understand that, which makes you want to grab them longer. And right now we just don't have that and hopefully it will be. Yeah. So um, so obviously we're working with the county court system. The city okay. right now. So, okay. Just city, city right now. Okay. Yes. So um, are from their standpoint, are they seeing these individuals who are going through the program as maintaining um or you know yeah, I mean, they're not like, coming back in correct. to see there us there the, that part i don't know we have started in october it takes three yeah. months to yeah, go yeah. through hopefully it would be nice if it's not yeah. <laughs> if they don't re repeat 
that part we, I don't know. We, we should definitely, I'd like at to least track come that. in the summer going yeah. back, so yeah. we should track that and, yeah. and see if we can see what that was submitting or, yes, what that yeah. rate is and see if that's, yeah. yeah, we'll say, yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to try to say anymore. <laughs> yeah, see what that rate I is. I had trouble saying collaboration earlier. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. What's been the parents' outcome after we run? Yeah. Every parent is not an answer to report with their kids. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sure that initial reaction is, you know, you need to migrate. <laughs> I only see the parents at the first. I don't okay. see them at the last. And a lot of times, these folks, these young people are driving. So when they leave after the last session, I don't get to see a parent when they pick them up. Yeah. There's been a couple parents where, they look at me and I'm like, yep, they're doing good. And the parents are receptive that they know that they can't be in there because it is a safe space. We do talk about family and that stuff does not get repeated. Out of it. We have norms and rules and expectations when we start the group. So students know that they can't talk about it outside the group. Everything stays private, even with their parent, except the night they reported information. I know there are some groups that, um, within the group, while you're continuing on with the, the group that's going on, so for example, the sick piece of you, Jaren mm -hmm. with you, they can't uh, be with other individuals outside of that group. Is that one of your guys' rules yeah. there as well, or? Well, so it depends. One aspect of that is if it's court order. So we had a couple co-defendants that they had to be specifically not, and I know this isn't your question, but not within the same group. Mm -hmm. We tell the students in the group is that it, us personally, if we see you outside, we're not going to go, hey, Timmy, how's it going? How are you feeling today? We're going to pretend like we don't know you unless you approach to us and you feel comfortable with it. Then you tell us outside of it's permission. But do we share that they can't mm -hmm. talk? We have not. And I know that would be hard because I know in one of the groups, uh, two students have a class together mm -hmm. at the high school. So, but what we do say is that nobody knows that you're here. We don't go and tell it. I did add, add per the recommendation through the counselors that if the counselors know that they're in group, if they can contact me and say, how are they doing? Because they could possibly be in counseling with a counselor at the school. Mm -hmm. So that information is being shared. So the students and the parent are aware of that. So the counselors are reaching out to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. just gonna ask. I'm, I'm fortunate this. enough to sit at um, our meetings where we all get together and I kind of give them an update about that. Any other questions? Um, future goals, uh, May Mental Health Month. So I'm looking to collaborate with some different school districts to put on a big show, and so to speak. We're trying to figure out what that looks like, and it's coming up quick. Um, I'd like to start a parent compass group. We, I had talked with the police department, and we would like to do some form of shop with the cop coming in December for families. And I'm working to do an exhale fair January 2024, and that is hands-on learning what um keeps you mindfulness in this world if it's photography and you've never done that before you can come to the fair and do it hands-on journaling gardening some stuff like that so working to collaborate with partnerships for that to happen in january parent compass group is a group that i had found it's support group so to speak for parents of teenagers um and there's certain types of groups that they have, and we do the parents one, where they could come together and collaborate on what problems that they have and focus on one certain problem and then key steps how to get that problem successful. Established. Who, who leads that? Um, I'm certified to lead it now. Okay. So, but I'm hoping that I can get other folks that are certified within our resiliency coalition to. And shop with a cop. Can you expand on that? Um, this is a, a idea that I would like to work with partners here at the city of Elkhorn and for families that are in need. 
and maybe have a certain requirements, not sure yet, brainstorming, and where we can have a dinner, a hands-on learning activity, instead of just going shopping, and then having some items met within their household that they need for the holiday season. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and energy. Thank you. You guys have a good night. Oh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Nice. There are some compliments sent on a lot of these initiatives she took to Marcel. For example, the, to be the spearhead, so to speak, to go and get the training and the certification done in order to create the program because it didn't exist in our region, um, just as with the recovery one, and, and then work to expand that and, and build that. and. I think it's going to have a, a lasting impact, not just in Elkhorn, but in the other communities around as they see those alternatives to um, giving the kids the assistance that they need in the families. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, referendum update. We did share a link in there. These are upcoming presentations, I would, or the schedule of groups and organizations that have asked for us to present to them. Um, I just have a, I had another one come in today from the town of Spring Prairie um, on March 16th, so we'll add that to the calendar. But just as a reminder, an open invite that any group or organization that wants information related to the referendum, we're happy to go wherever they'd like and share the information or answer any questions. The, and then I'll turn this over to Mr. Cherwin. He put together a forecast, a very good question that's come up that um, Tony Evers announced his budget proposal and what would that look like knowing that we, the, the school board with the information that we had at the time and the timeline in which you have to submit the questions to go to referendum, you have to do your best guess as to what the state would put for funding. And so our parameters that we put in was $200 increase per pupil on the revenue limit for both years in the biennium. That was what we based the referendum ask on. The question that comes up is now Governor Evers released that budget. Uh, what does that look like? Is the board committed to, if the referendum were to pass, only utilizing you know, up to you know, the dollar amount that was needed to um, continue business as, as we have. So, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. And I, before I turn it over to you, I'll just say, uh, Governor Zebra's budget is a point of pass. Exactly. So it's a, it's a pipe dream it's that if, if people are, and depending on where you're sitting from, if you're being, the reality is it's not going to pass Correct. as constituted. So where will it lie at the end of the day? Probably somewhere between I would wager closer to what we projected, yeah, but exactly. who knows? It's, but it, it's nice. It's a good question to ask, and I'll turn on the bell and you can go ahead and speak to that. Jason, I think you just summed it up. I think it was just worth costing out because what he outlined, I guess, in November, and then what he announced in February were a little different. Mm -hmm. So, um, he included a lot more money for special education. That was probably the biggest component. So when you add that in, along with the per pupil of 350 and 650, and then the increase in the, the per pupil allocation, that has a significant impact. And again, like Jason mentioned, I certainly not indicating we think that's going to be our reality, but it may be somewhere in between those two scenarios. The question is where and who knows. Um, but the next step in the process is the Joint Finance Committee, which is the arm of the legislature that really does the budget development, will now start their process. And they'll do a series of hearings around the state. And they'll probably do that for a month or two. And then from that, they will look at the governor's budget. They may modify it. They may write their own budget. And then that will go back and forth probably until June or July. And, and that will probably be when hopefully we'll find out what the final state budget looks like. But that's a typical pattern. We really don't know until June or July. And 
and a lot of those final decisions happen kind of at the 11th hour. And, and we'll have kind of a sense maybe of where things might be, but again, things change quickly through that legislative and governor process in Madison. So again, like Jason mentioned, just wanted to get kind of a, a, a view of what that looks like and then you know, how that compares. But right. certainly not having yeah. that's going to be a reality. Yeah, it does have a huge impact on that projected shortfall right. because the proposed budget does keep up with inflationary costs over the next biennium. So it eliminates that deficit. It doesn't do anything for the prior biennium where it was a zero dollar revenue right. with an increase right. for the two years right. and didn't keep up with the inflation for the past two years. Right. But it does significantly reduce. So whatever the legislature and the governor that they come together on, the closer it gets to the inflationary projections, then it has a significant impact on the reduction of our shortfall. Because a $200 per people increase, which was what we you know, projected, because that's been, it, it hasn't even been typical, it's been like in the best years right. since 0809 has been about $200. Um, that, Accounts for it's now less than two percent, really. It accounts for about 1.7, 1.8 yeah. percent. So, when you're looking at you know overall CPI, but it's it falls well short of what costs are. And, and, you really want to and there's a link there you can see for Governor Evers. If you yeah. click on that, that's a school board summary of the state budget as he's proposed. And there's a lot in there, um, yeah. It'll be an interesting process going through um, with the legislatures and the governor and how they work that out. Any other questions related to that? Yeah, I'll have a great discussion on this because I did a deep dive today doing analytical uh, processing of the numbers, which you just told me it's a fictitious number. And um, I'm, in a, I'm in a math class way above my head, I guess. Uh, but I was looking and trying to analyze the numbers uh, and referendum scenarios and try to get clear uh, um, explanations because I'm quite confused and I'm sure many people in the community are. I looked back at our uh, financial analysis scenarios, uh, scenario one and two, which was $200 uh, increase per pupil, and then a scenario three, which was a proposed Governor Evers at $350. Um, and re reading today, it looked like his proposal was $300 per pupil. Um, but as I analyzed all of our information, nothing lines up because if you look at the slides you have up right now, the budget forecast with $200 per year per pupil increase that we have listed, we have the projected deficit listed right now at $3,478,000. But in the financial analysis that we did earlier while we were trying to formulate numbers, it was $3,766,138 or $3,619,621. So those don't align. Um, and then the tax impact per 100,000 on what we have now is $120 the first year, 23, 24, 185, the following year, 198. But when we wrote the referendum question, I believe for question one, uh, the five year non reoccurring um, operational referendum came out to $198 per 100,000. And the reoccurring one for the um, 4K program was $17 per 100,000. As I look at that now, nothing lines up. And then if we look at Governor Evers' proposal, it says $69 per 100,000. And I know you said that's, that's not realistic, but it becomes more confusing then. So as I look at it, the real question is I have, when the community goes for referendum. We're, we are voting on a $6 million for each of the five years, correct? Correct. Well, so 
So what happens if we don't need to use all six million? How does that impact the levy? Um, does it get prorated or whatever? I'm afraid we're going to end up in a Monroe type of situation um, because if you take six million dollars over five years, that's thirty million. And looking at our numbers right now, uh, that puts a thirteen million dollar excess into the fund ten balance. Um, and I know there's no definitive numbers right now, but it makes it hard to explain to people where are the realities of this? Because like I said, the first one we came out was 198 for part A and 17 for part B. And now none of those numbers line up anymore. And our forecast at $200 per year, which we worked with before on both scenario one and two, now it says 120 and 185. Um, so I, I guess the more I looked into it, the more confused I am. And if I'm confused and I have all the information, I'm really concerned about the voters. Well, Paul, we took your feedback off of that question. You, you're absolutely right. The question is $6 million. Mm -hmm. here, uh, the tax impact is 198. That hasn't changed. What Bill's showing in this chart is our projected need is less than the six million, which the board committed to under levying on that. Based off of your input, not wanting to sound like used car salesmen or confusing the public by having right. that step in approach, all of our communication on our flyers or on the website sticks to, and if you look at that information, the 198, projected per hundred thousand dollars in property value so avoid that confusion but we've all known all along that that impact is more than likely to be much less than that based on what is actually utilized but based off of your feedback when that question was put together the board felt that it was better to put the worst case scenario the six million dollars per year for all five years so that we don't run into a situation like monroe where they under communicated what that tax impact would be. But the reality is, if you were to ask, the tax impact is probably going to be much less, even in the scenario of $200 per pupil. And that's all this chart is showing is that that projected deficit, what the district would need to balance, is not going to be the full six million. So if I'm understanding you correctly, here, so what you're saying is, is Everything that we're telling the community is that that six million at one ninety eight for one hundred thousand, correct? And then we're hoping that it'll be less than that, and that's what that chart's showing. Yes, and I would put a huge wager that it will be less than that. But we didn't want we wanted worst case scenario communicated. That was the decision of the group. Yeah. So that no matter where that came out, because we don't know what the budget's going to be, what it's going to land but um we're pretty confident it's going to be quite a bit less than that impact that also doesn't account for we talked about this at the time any property tax state aids that the, the state would put into the formula to lower the local value as well which we're sure that will come back to us but yes uh you're, you're absolutely right that this is a worst case scenario projection that whatever it comes back at you know, well, we can almost guarantee it'd be less than that. This is what we decided to communicate out so that people would know that worst case scenario is best we can project. And in terms of property values, we are very concerned looking at like a two or three percent increase over the next, as opposed to, I think, the example that you mentioned used the 17 percent increase. All we did is put out there, and, and you're right, Paul, in, in regards to fictitious, it's not to make a judgment either way on Governor Evers' budget. It's just we had questions from the community. Well, Evers put this budget out. What does that look like? Can you change the amount on the referendum? We can't go back and change what the question dollar amount is, but the board does not have to levy to the amount that's approved by the community. All the revenue limit increase does is it authorizes the board to go up to that dollar amount. But the board can under levy and the board committed to levy just to that amount that they need to operate. So there's no desire. And currently right now, we're in a fiscal position where we don't have to short-term borrow. 
where we don't have to take out those loans, there's no need to increase the, the fund balance by $13 million. That would be, there, there's no need to do that. So I don't foresee the school board voting to, to put, you know, approve a budget that would do that. So the second, the second uh, chart that we're looking at right now with the governor's Now so I understand it. that, you know, hey, we're, we're talking theoretically a pipe dream here, right? right. But theoretically, if that was to pass as written currently, Mm -hmm. That just simply changes the amount from the original uh, chart that you were looking at. That's what I'm looking at. Here. Correct. Yes. All right. mm -hmm. yep. This just says if Evers budget were to pass as proposed, this is what our projected budget deficit comes to. What we had discussed, and Paul, you were a big part of that, was when we were going back and forth between the reoccurring and the non reoccurring, was that we don't know what Evers is going to project. I mean, we had no clue back then, and then what's going to be passed. Um, with the budget, but that we need to show good faith to the community that we're only going to use what is absolutely necessary. Right. And that's why we didn't do the reoccurring. We said non reoccurring five years up to this amount, knowing that this would be worst case scenario. And right. As I said, as I, I just analyzed more though, when the numbers didn't match up to what we had done in our financial analysis, I, I got more confused and, and am more confused. So when the voters vote, if it passes and we don't have to use all that money, does that, how, how does that impact the increase on individual tax liabilities? Or does it just benchmark it at 6 million? I guess that's, that's the question. Does it benchmark it at 6 million and everybody's increase is there and then they'll figure it out? Or does the county somehow uh, re reevaluate and uh, say, okay, yours is only going up one hundred and thirty seven dollars per hundred thousand. We, we set the the local levy each year after we receive the notice of you know what we're receiving from the state. The board votes in the fall and sets that levy. And so if the dollar amount is less than six million, that would obviously lower that potential tax impact on on the individuals. There are other factors. You're right on home evaluation, how that goes, and and we all see that from year to year. If one community um, reassesses their home values and they go up, and another community doesn't, but overall that levy amount would be less. Therefore, that overall tax impact would be less. Yeah, I guess as I'm looking at it, it's just not it's not a withdrawal and a deposit at the vote. It gets reevaluated, and then if the district says we only need 3.8 million, then that number for every household is recalculated? Well, the levy would be less, therefore it wouldn't be as large of a projected impact. But, but I mean, they reevaluated at that time. So in the fall, the school district is going to say, this is the money we need. It's less than the $6 million we had um, had voted for, and then they'll reevaluate and say it's this much per hundred thousand, and then you'll get a bill. You'll have a deficit uh, in your banking account at that point, or do they they just bankroll it at the six million, and then work from there, and then we dip into what we need. No, well, that the board, yeah, that would only be if the board levied the full six million, which the committee is not. It was to levy only what was needed. Some boards will do a non-recurring referendum and they'll state that part of it is to do operation costs and to increase our fund balance. This board just has to continue operational costs. So if I'm, so. If I'm understanding correctly, um, and I'm, I apologize if I use an analogy that's gonna make people nervous. So, um, so if you if say for example, um, I'm meeting a I, I'm meeting a new vehicle. The loan the the, the bank approves me for twenty five thousand dollars. I don't need to go and spend that full twenty five thousand dollars. Correct. I can spend twenty thousand dollars instead. Only if I got a loan for twenty thousand dollars. Correct. And instead of paying two hundred and fifty dollars per month, I'm now paying two hundred dollars per month. Is that what we're talking about? Here? Yes. I think we just recalculate it every single year yes. in the fall when we come back. We then decide, hey, now we need, instead of $6 million, we only need a million and a half this year. Right. Uh, it's just basically like, 
again, I apologize for this this uh, uh, comparison. It's basically like a line of credit almost. Not exactly. I mean, I know that's not what it yeah, is. It's, it's called a revenue limit. Right. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. Okay. It's a revenue limit. Okay. It's a great analogy. And you don't yeah. have to go up to that. Right. Okay. The, that projection that we share is if you were to go up to that full limit. What's the current what currently do we have? Does anybody know? It's based on a per pupil and your membership number. Yeah. Would you so know it's like, it's like thirty-nine million dollars would be our revenue cap mm -hmm. today. Okay. So the problem the per pupil amount and our enrollment are the year average. That never okay. changes. And we're sh and we're seeing a sh and, and then we like receive okay. yeah. yeah, and about a third of that thirty-nine million is made up from the local tax levy. The remainder is made up through state days and yes, the state. Right. So okay. Because last year's tax levy for, for all the operations was about twenty million. Okay. Okay. Got okay, you. Gotcha. That just that does help. Any other questions or discussions related to that chart? So I mean, I hate to even introduce more data pieces, but that was a legitimate question that people asked and, right. and a point of confusion. With the governor Evers budget, how does that does that change our questions? Right. It doesn't change our questions. Um, if the dollar amount comes in higher than what the state gives and what we're projecting, then of course that would lower what we would need in the local. Not because we don't right. want to change the question. We can't change the question. Right. Change the question. So just right. to communicate to the public, it's not yeah. that we're like being greedy here and saying. Well, we really want to take it all. I mean, we can't change it. Right. We projected worst case scenario and was honest about worst case scenario to the public. And 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 Paul, we had lots of discussions about we have to prove ourselves over the next five years and right. you know, any of that because it's a non reoccurring. So I mean that gives future boards are gonna figure that one out. So, but we're gonna be very honest about what we need. So, in regards to the uh, again, this is uh, we're talking pipe dreams here. It's not going to happen. But in regards to Governor Evers' budget, we have um, the the money that that they're currently debating right now over in Madison is a one time. They they don't have that money constantly coming in. So, do, you know what, Jason, I'm not I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. So, um, I, 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 that's right. That they, they have mentioned that that is a concern that the legislators are discussing. What are one time one time revenues that we have? How do those get expended? And because they're not going to want to commit more money to the revenue limit unless they know that they have future revenues coming in. Okay, and that's what I was going to say. So they'll be cautious as what they put to the revenue limit. He'll probably throw out grants like Evers put in three hundred thousand dollars a district our size for school mental health. Yeah, and. What we'll have to look at is okay, how long does that last? Right, right. You know, does it yeah. allow you to offset resources you already have? Does it you allow you to add? Right. If so, is that funding going to continue or not? So, yeah, that, it can get, there's a lot of minutiae there, but they, that's what they're going to have to debate is what are we able to fund ongoing and what are we going to fund through one time grants? So, theoretically, in five, well, it's a five year budget, theoretically, in a five year, uh, five years from now, if that, that money is all on the leader, we just reassess at that point and reevaluate yes. and go with that. Yes. Correct. Okay. And one of the, the details, even in the governor's budget, is just there's certain state budget language where they talk about some certain or some sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that has a very different meaning. Like for special education, it's usually defined as the some certain, which is an allocation for special education. Right. And then if costs go up, Percentage reimbursement keeps going down. He's included in his budget that it would be some sufficient, which means they would guarantee the funding level to maintain 60%. Gotcha. Oh, so that's a very different way yes. of looking at it. You know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, is there any chance that they would have to look at the state budget to look at the state budget? Yeah. Okay. So, is there any chance that the legislature's not going to do an increase at all? I think it's a chance. <laughs> um, I, I <laughs> Are we looking at an even worse scenario? I mean, could we even freeze it for another year? Yeah. I, I, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. Well, the, number, the numbers that we have, not the, not, not the reverse of the budget, but the original budget, that one's if we get nothing at all. That's no change at all from the state, right? No, that, no that's, that's just including $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200. $200.
Gotcha. I'm just saying that, that I, this would be another and, and, and my, like we did yeah, not get yeah. any increase. In, in my discussions with the legislature, Julia, there are some legislatures within you know the, the caucus. And I, I had a conversation with Representative August. And there are some, and Representative August is not one who runs on a platform that um, he doesn't believe in increasing revenue rates. Right. Because um, there are some politicians that feel if you need any increased spending for schools, right. go to referendum, have the community vote, let them increase it because I, as a politician, ran a platform, I will increase taxes yeah. and a revenue limit is an increase. Right. Um, our, you know, Representative August, in the conversation I had with him, does not philosophically believe that. Okay. Um, now I asked him, you know, and he knows that with the budget surplus and where it's at, I feel very safe that two hundred dollars okay. per pupil would get approved through that. But he did share there are some members in the caucus in that caucus that firmly will always be a zero. Right. Um, I just didn't on know the revenue limit because those. they philosophically believe right. communities should have to pass by vote to increase school funding. Right. And it's a new paradigm for those individuals, but I don't believe the full caucus will. I tried to pin him down on a dollar amount. He, he went, yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> give me a he chuckled at when I asked, you know, if they could be 600 to make up for right. the, last two years. the last two years, 200. Plus right. 200. Right. He said, yeah, there's probably no way that's going to happen. And that's probably on average closer to in line with what Peter said. So I, I think the 200 projection is, I think it'll come out a little better okay. than 200, but okay. hypothetically, but it be, yeah. Okay. Uh, but that would be but a tough unlikely. sell politically for them okay. as well to start schools. We're just going back to the pre COVID numbers. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Correct. I think one of the questions I was trying to think through is it's just the timing of this process. That in the perfect world, it's kind of the June, July state starts to yeah. the fiscal year. We have a budget, we know where we're going. But some occasions, we're sitting here in September and October still waiting to see what the state budget is. Right. And that's a possibility, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They hope both sides get together and work on it so that we know in a reasonable time frame like that. Yeah. Any other questions? Or right? so this is a very good discussion. Thank you, Bob, for bringing up those. those yeah. Questions. Like I said, I just I started doing analytical processing, and when numbers weren't matching up, I got more confused. I shouldn't be in that uh, advanced math class. <laughs> I know. I know. What I want to see, and I can't find it on any of the pages. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paul. Yep. All right, uh, we have, let's see, I don't want to still marry Thunder. She's, I don't know if the name was on or not, but um, these went through the policy committee. A lot of work from our school nurse on updating our um, policy striking old language and then updating it to reflect either current practice or current recommendations um in there so i'll go through these fairly quick you um did that only have time if there's any questions stop me but this is basically striking all of this old um language which you'll see were like mandatory uh, there's only a requirement within the four case centers, which is a part of that four case center uh, requirement, that everything else is going to a recommendation in that, it, with the exception of those who participate in the middle and high school athletics. Um, then we have the update to the vision hearing and uh, scoliosis and academic screening process. You'll see uh, the striking of the, the language of the first part, updating the ages in which the hearing screenings are conducted uh, based on the recommendations by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and parents have the option to opt out if they don't want their kids to be screened. Um, I'll say, I don't know, I felt guilty as a parent, but all three of my older kids were or all caught on their vision through the school screenings that they Mine was a very doctor. He had three surgeries because of it. So yeah. thank you. I had one with hearing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for um, hearing. But it's up to the parents. If they don't want yeah. their kids to do the screening, they can have them out. Any questions on those? 
Oh, and scoliosis has not been, that really hasn't been a part of the school screening since uh, early yeah. 2009. Okay. Section 504 policy, going from a short, succinct policy, but um, based on legal recommendations, uh, <laughs> and even the history of all school board policies, there's never been um, such an expansion. But this was a policy that uh, Emily Lynn and her team worked very hard on, went through with uh, legal counsel, looking at other model policies as well, to make sure that we capture all the legal requirements related to 504. So I would just open that up to are there specific questions related to it? Otherwise, this is a first reading. We can review it and ask more questions in between now and the next meeting and bring those answers back to the next board meeting. No questions, we'll move on from there. And then this is a proposal to delete the old 504 of the outdated yeah. procedures. That's all I have for the first reading. We'll see you again next meeting. Recommendation to the next All right. Um, always torn when, when I share these because I, I'm very happy for the individuals that they reach this point in their career. But um, this year we have a, a number of retirees that are my husband's classmates. I reached that point, your husband's <laughs> classmates. <laughs> so we have um, Cheryl Neinfeldt, Natalie Marcel, uh, Tim Neinfeldt, Paul Schneider, and Bridget Truen, who have all submitted their letters of retirement for the end of this year. Uh, their positions are listed on there. And we'll be doing a retiring celebration at the end of the year, but uh, you'll see their years of experience, 31, 32, 24, 16, and 25 years at the school district respectively amongst those individuals. And we have the transfer of uh, Brenda Lickner um, to serve as a special ed teaching assistant at Options and the appointment of Melissa Cocroft as a West Side special education teaching assistant. Any questions for Mr. <laughs> I tried that as well. It didn't work. I, you know, I, I do think it, it is in part reflected too. We're reaching that point where we're running into the teachers who have the um, 403D post employment benefit rather than that insurance credit, which used to kind of be you know, there was that division when Act 10 came in that they had to have 15 years of experience in the district at the time, correct, Bill? Correct. And then if they worked until 58, they received a $40,000 insurance credit. And then um, 60 and 62, I think, were the, is that correct on the intervals? Mm -hmm. um, so now we're running into- 55. Yeah, 55, 56, yeah. Yep. When they're becoming retirement eligible and uh, yeah, taking advantage of that. Great. Any questions? I'll move to approve the personal recommendation sheet for February 27th, 2023, including new employment contracts conditioned upon passing the background check and district mandated truck screening as presented. Is there a second? <clears throat> so moving to second to approve the personal recommendation sheet for February 27th, 2022, including 2023. Including new employment contracts conditioned upon passing the background check and district mandated for the screening test. Mr. Gayhart. Yes. Mr. Gatton. Yes. Mrs. Ingersoll. Yes. Mr. Martell. Yes. Oh, yes. Mrs. Ray. Yes. Mr. Scarrow. Yes. Ms. Colton. Yes. Ms. Williams. Yes. Motion carried. Looks like we don't have any gifts this evening. Yes, this evening. Wow. So, no. No. Um, on Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the FFA uh, alumni banquet, at, which I wanted to share with the board that they had um, awarded and recognized Barb um, Fisher as a friend of the alumni. And I know that was an event that um, you would go to on a, I on an annual basis, and Barb was always yeah. there every year and a big supporter of the FFA alumni. So that was a great honor that they shared with her. They also announced that their chapter was named the Wisconsin Chapter of the Year. 
and will be advanced on to the national level um, for recognition. And Derek Papke was recognized as the FFA Young Alumni Member of the Year in Wisconsin, uh, which was a great um, honor. They do, they've been doing tremendous work in what they provide for support for our students and um, the access and opportunities that they create and the amount of money that they generate from, they work hard in working to be the prepare the fundraisers. They have a, a lot of different ones to fund and subsidize these opportunities for the students so they can all afford to go and do these great things. So I want to give a big shout out and thanks to them. And then um, as board members, you may have received in your emails an invite from the National Honor Society for Thursday, March 6th. Um, appetizer starts six ceremony at 6 50. I just we would just need to know since the entire board was invited if you plan to attend so we can still stitch if needed. If March 9th. Yeah, March 9th. I want to say March 9th. Yeah, March 9th. I want to say March 9th. Yeah, 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 so, and you don't have to let me know this evening, but if you would uh, make up a good email, and then we'll just post it. And that's all that I have for the announcements. Um, just a reminder again in the board notes, I just uh, review board uh, policy 872 when you have an opportunity, and I put some notes in that later. Like that. So that's it. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Fifteen second to adjourn. All right. Genius first. Is that Ed was second? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Gayard. Yes. Mr. Gatton. Yes. Mrs. Ingersoll. Yes. Mr. Martell. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Ray. Yes. Mr. Scarrow. Yes. Ms. Colton. Yes. Ms. Williams. Yes.